It's time! The ATM Podcast. Apologise to me, Mark Watson. With me, my name is Martin Devlin from The Platform. The All Black Season grading, I gave them a B-. minus. And I'm going to argue till the <laughs> death, Watto, that they deserve that. We will talk the Qatar World Cup. We'll talk about rugby's rules, and by God, they need to lose about a 1,000 of them. Razor, England job or All Blacks job, Cristiano Ronaldo, Guppy gets gone, all of that. Apologise to me. Welcome back, the man, Mark Watson. And don't guff for oh, my All Blacks rating, mate, because you know a B-minus is fair. Three out of ten I gave them the other day. Three out of ten. What did we win? Eight. It was really seven. Let's not kid ourselves about that Bledisloe Cup test. History will say we won it by two. Everybody knows that Mathieu Reynard, this lunatic French referee, basically cost Australia that test. And we would have been saying exactly the same thing if it had been on the other foot. Uh, we lose two. We lose a series to Ireland at home right there. I mean, that's basically a one out of ten. It doesn't matter what you do. You don't lose home series. You know, we lost to Argentina at home as well. I'm not sure how you get a B minus out of that, Martin. I'd love to hear your justification on it. We, 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 no, no, Martin, Martin, you're delusional. You're too close to Fozzie, mate. You are not thinking rationally. Martin, I tell you, and you should know this, as the great Murray Deaker once said to me, if you want to do this game well, don't get too close to anybody. Oh, because please. You Good lose, God you lose Almighty. I mean, all of a sudden, you, you and Deeks are balance. giving me lessons on how to do my job, for God's sake. I give them a B minus, mate, because... If we'd beaten because, England, that was closing the season out with seven wins in a row. And you've got we, to say there has it, been improvement, Mark. There, look, since we got beaten by Ireland, I acknowledge that. We got pants to Nelspur. We came back, did it well in Joburg. OK, in Christchurch, we were ineffective. But we're not the only team in the world that's like this. Tell me a team that is consistent in world rugby at the moment. No one is. Even the French are scratchy with their wins. Historically, the All Blacks are... And this is what you don't see. You've now become like the masses here, Martin. You're accepting it's okay to lose. I mean, I listen again to Foster's rhetoric in that press conference. I'm happy with where we're at. The focus is the World Cup. Stop making the Rugby World Cup the focus. Let me just lay this out. I was running through that World Cup draw yesterday. Mm -hmm. Now, so we've got France in our pool, right? On the other side in pool B. They've got Ireland and South Africa. Now, after the quarterfinals, two of the four best teams in the world exit the tournament. We could play France, then we'll rest and rotate, and then we'll come back for a one-off quarterfinal against either Ireland or South Africa, and then we could end up going home, and we could easily go home against either of those two sides in France. There's no consistency. Still not enough to suggest that that we're going to win those quarterfinals. And so this last three years, this you accepting mediocrity, you giving them a B-minus, what does it all mean, mate? What does it all mean? All we've done is bastardise the All Black brand, Martin. Stop lowering the standards, Martin Devlin. Okay? We expect Please, too I much. Expect we demand from... too agree. much of them. That's what we I... do, Mark. We need to bring the no, fun we... back like the Black Ferns. We need the euphoria. We need the happiness. That's what sport is about. It's not being miserable like you. It's not sitting in front of the TV, picking holes in every single thing that they do. We're meant to celebrate this team. Enjoy the experience. Hey, why don't we replace the National Anthem and the Hugger then with Kumbaya, my lord, and campfires burning and hold hands and sing old Lang Syne, mate. And, you know, hey, everybody's a winner. Hey, we'll go real in this socialist society we live in, mate. Brilliant, Martin, brilliant. Hey, let's get rid of anything called winning. Let's get rid of anything called effort. Let's get rid of... Hey, let's just bastardise brands completely. Forget the All Blacks legacy. Let's just go and ruin the last 130 years. Well, the rugby union's doing that. The rugby rugby union's already done that, mate. They're selling the All Blacks 15. They're selling the All Blacks 7. Nobody even knows who the All Blacks are anyway. I mean, and the All Blacks are a team at the moment who are stuck in the pack with the rest. you got to say, mate, come on, you were happy with the first 70 minutes against England. We all were, weren't we? Oh, look, I, I, yeah, I was surprised. I was actually surprised at how poor bloody England were, to be perfectly honest. Um, but, you know, it's funny, though, at the end of the day, we sit there and somehow there's a draw. Somehow it comes back to Ian Foster. Nothing's ever easy. Nothing is ever simple with this guy. Meanwhile, there's discussion about Ronan O'Gara and Scott Robertson coaching England. You know, we've got Tony Brown and we've got Jamie Joseph coaching Japan. We've got Dave Rennie coaching Australia. We've got coaches all over the world. And here we are left with a guy who never deserved the job, who was given the job, who was handed to him through nothing short of complete and utter nepotism, mate. You know, it's 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 
Yeah, and but you, you hated the last guy. You also think you said the same about Shag, and Shag won us a World Cup. Come on, look at the moment. There is no, no one in world rugby I, head I, and shoulders above the rest, mate. I mean, and and, and that and look, I, I've accepted that about our team. You might call it accepting mediocrity. I've I, I've accepted the fact that this group of players aren't the best group of players in the world. But we go to a World Cup with probably as much of a punch as chance as everyone else. Whether we can win three games back to back to back, I doubt that as well, Mark. But I'm not sure that yeah. any of the teams that we're going to play are actually in a position where they can actually say we are the best and we're going to prove it. So why do we continue with this model of planning three years out and killing everything in the form? I mean, look at South Africa, 2018, but he's 57-0 by us, going to win the damn thing. Stop overthinking this. It's funny, though, isn't it? No one wanted Ian Foster as coach. No one believed he was good enough. We've had a really turbulent time under his tenure. But he was just coincidentally unlucky to get a bad crop of players and un- unlucky just has come at a time when the rest of the world and there happens to be parody in world rugby. Rubbish. We've always been a nose ahead, even when there's been debt behind us. Oh, I, just, I, I, oh, mate, I think you're actually... I, I'll, I'll go back I, through I, the pages of history and I will dispute that because there was a time between about 1989, uh, 1990 and about 1994 or five where we were actually not the best team in the world. I'll go back through 2008, 2009, yeah, we weren't the best not, team in the world. I mean, right now not, we're not the best team in the world. These things are cyclical. They do happen. Apologise to me! Let's talk about yeah, Razor. Is Razor going to take that England job or is this just a fudge to convince the rugby union that you'd better sign him up right now to take over for me and Foster after the World Cup? Oh, Go and coach England, mate. Why do you want to work for this absolute moronic administration? Why? They just treat people poorly. It's just complete and out of an old boys network. They haven't shown him the respect. They haven't shown any other coach respect. Anybody that ever stood up against Steve Hansen was gone. Oh, I mean, just go, Scotty. Go and get appreciated somewhere, mate. Go and take more of our intellectual property over. You think he's going to be appreciated in England, matter. mate? They, they treat their coaches worse than what we do. I mean, they, I mean, I, I absolutely acknowledge what you're saying the about that. I think it's it... Scott Robertson. Scott Robertson is a winner, mate. He's not going to get beaten up by the media because he's going to win. But meanwhile, we'll have our players back here saying, hey, give me another million dollars or I might consider playing overseas and I might not be an All Black. And we'll go, OK. No, we let him go. Be I'm with you, but we've talked about this. Go. Let them go, we, let them go, let them go, yeah, let them go. I mean, on, anyone that signs on, up for a sabbatical to me is already gone, mate. I mean, I'm not... Okay, look, and, and we've argued about that. We haven't actually. We've actually agreed on this, that the rugby union has lost control and that the tail now wags the dog. Every single egg they have and it's not just on the field it's off the field is in that World Cup basket mate without that there is nothing here that is the peak of the pyramid and they're praying that the All Blacks finally get up and manage to do it in France look Mark they've got a chance we go there with a chance we don't go there with the best chance but we certainly go there with a chance I go to Las Vegas with a chance too, Martin, and I look around and I see these hotels and I see these grand casinos and I think, I wonder why they're here. Oh, that's right. The Las house. Vegas it wasn't that's built on right. winners. Yeah, it's well. not a wise thing to gamble, isn't it? Let's just gamble with New Zealand rugby. Martin, Martin, I thought you were the last bastion of decency when it came to common sense around rugby, Martin. But clearly, clearly you've been hanging out with the Labour Party somewhere. Apologise to me! The Qatar World Cup. Let's talk about that, shall we? We'll park Ronaldo for a second and get to him because the whole thing bores me, I must admit. I'm over it and I'm glad that he's gone and he's out of it. But Qatar, the Saudi Arabians today, I mean, this is the best sports watching they could do. Forget the live tour, forget staging heavyweight boxing, forget buying F1, forget paying uh, uh, David Beckham £300 million to go to Qatar and be the spokesperson, Morgan Freeman to line up and line his pockets as well. They went and beat Argentina. They did it on the field. All of the off-field stuff means nothing. They actually got a victory on the field. Oh, look, it's wonderful, isn't it? I've been doing these predictions in recent nights, and I actually predicted Argentina would beat Saudi Arabia 5-0. I was pretty good on the second day. I put most of those ones correctly, and then suddenly, 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 you just turn around and go, how did that happen? And it does, it takes you back to, I think it was Senegal beating France back in 2002. Um, Algeria beating the Germans, I think, in what, 82 yeah. before the peace pact with Austria. Cam- Cam- Cameroon. Yes, yeah, Cameroon, Cameroon upset. Cameroon beating Argentina That's in 1990. United States beating England 1950. A lot of people, older generation, will remember that. But that is the beautiful thing about football, isn't it? Oh, look, I had a season a couple of years ago um, supporting Liverpool, and it wasn't a great season. A lot of the games, they dominated 70, 75% of possession and somehow found a way to lose. 
And that's what football does. That's what it does. You want a sense of nationalism. You want to bring a country together. Sport still does it better than anything. I mean, there'll be a lot of people going, oh, really, did it have to be Saudi Arabia uh, with their human rights record? Mind you, they're happy to turn a blind eye to America's foreign policy or to some of these other countries and how they just hide behind Western civilization politically and justify everything they do. But Martin, um, yeah, wonderful, wonderful for the tournament and now every small country in that tournament including Costa Rica have just a little bit of hope yeah they they? do yeah but also the World Cup of Football and I was speaking about this yesterday I mean forget rugby forget the women's forget the men's forget the rugby league World Cup forget the T20 and the the one day World Cup this is the one true global tournament and the, the curious thing about FIFA is they because they want a world game the best 32 teams aren't there Mark if the best 32 teams were selected you'd probably have 30 European teams and you'd probably have Argentina and Brazil attached to it or Maybe they might. I mean, it'd be that close because there's so many great European teams that missed out. But also with the FIFA World Cup, you can have this kind of result. It does happen, as you just outlined before. It's not something that, look, we had Japan beating South Africa once in 20, 2015 at the World Cup. It just doesn't happen in those other sports as often as we'd wish that it would happen. There is a real fairy tale aspect to the football of the World Cup. But what about the politics going on behind it, mate? You've got reporters there wearing armbands. You've got players that want to wear rainbow things, all in defiance of both FIFA and Qatar. Is it fair that that, that that they get stopped doing that, they get threatened doing that, they get told they're going to get sent home? Or is this a world that we live in where you should be able to express your political beliefs and someone else who doesn't hold those should be mature enough to say, yes, I acknowledge that even though I don't concur with that? Yeah, well, I'm 100% with you on that one, Martin. Absolutely. Look, um, you know, and this is the great thing, isn't it? FIFA on one hand talk the talk around those areas, but then when it actually comes down to it, the, the, the brown envelope full of money will override any of that. And so there's a lot of virtual signalling that goes on from a lot of these organisations. And this is the big thing for Qatar. They wanted this to promote the region, people to come and visit them, and it's just become an absolute minefield. I mean, this, you know, basically apartheid towards people that um, sexuality differs from yours is just... It, it's, it's revolting, it's mate. Just so, it's hideous, isn't it's it? It's so archaic. It's so archaic. Um, You know, the way women are treated, it's just absolutely, completely, utterly archaic. And how FIFA can allow this to happen and stand up there and still somehow believe they've got some level of integrity. And even while the even while they've been under the microscope, even while they've been under that magnifying glass, they still go out there and still do some dumb stuff by not allowing people into grounds because they're wearing rainbow coloured hats or love hearts. Um, in recognition or a silent protest. Uh, you know, a lot of people say, oh, we shouldn't combine politics and sport, but politicians are always the first ones to... You know, um, yeah, to leech all over the way. Of course promoting. they are, mate. Absolutely. To, 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 you know, any kind of chance that they get to, to, to jump that bandwagon. Look at our politicians. They all do it, mate. Yeah, and FIFA are just the laughing stock of the world at the moment. You know, their brand has just been damaged um, beyond belief. Well, has it though, Mark? Uh, has no, it? I mean, I don't see any of their sponsors has, pulling out, I mean, mate. The, I mean, it the, has the, for the, people the, like you and me, but I don't see any of their sponsors. I don't see any any loss of revenue income. I don't see any. Sure, it might be a loss of face as far as media articles go, or maybe a few fans feel. The FIFA train rolls on, mate, and that is the biggest gravy train in world sport, and it's never going to stop. No, but football rolls on. I think football rolls on. I think that people look at FIFA, and I think there will be in time sponsors looking at this going, oh yeah, not in our best interest, maybe we just go for the Premier League and sponsor that, maybe we just go for some individual teams. I think there will be a backlash on this, and if there's not, again, this just shows that for all the virtue signalling yep. that goes on, yep. for all for all of the preaching, at the end of the day, it's all overridden when it comes down to it, the bottom line, and um, that's what I struggle with. And we've seen it here in our media recently, the amount of coverage the women's rugby team got, and it was all in the name of equity, um, in women's sport, but yet they were happy to then go and prejudice the women's rugby league team. Why didn't they get the same amount of coverage? I know, I know. I know. Because and, again, and it's a great question. Yeah, and course. it's complete and utter hypocrisy. It is. It is. And look, and, but, you know, having said that, look at but, you know, having said that, look at the sponsor in terms of Budweiser, who were told what a day beforehand they couldn't pull beer. They didn't pull their sponsorship. Yeah. Hell no. And they're not going to going to give it up for the next World Cup either. I mean, you know, this is the, the ultimate hypocrisy. All of these companies that, if you actually looked at their manifestos or their copup or whatever it is you want to call it, and they sit there and they go, "Oh no, we're into." inclusivity, we're into this, we're into that. Not one of them has stood up to FIFA. Not one of them has actually said, hang on, commercial yeah. interests here, we're, we're going to actually hold our money, or we're actually going to... No, they won't, because they know that there's another one standing in line. There's another big corporation. If Coca-Cola don't do it, Pepsi will jump it. If Budweiser don't want it, Miller Lite will take it. We know this to be real. 
And, and if you walk into these same organizations, they'll be first to shove in your face saying, hey, we've got the rainbow tick. That's We're it. rainbow friendly That's with inside totally this organization. And, it's just all shite, mate. Big box. All shite. It's just a big box ticking exercise in a political environment where, yeah, there's zero sincerity. Okay, zero I'm going to throw this one at you then, Watto, because I know that this is going to be, I'm coming in from the members end, man. I've got a shiny ball. It's a grassy track. There is pace. There is bounce. I'm heaving this one down towards you. It's called Kane Williamson didn't play the last T20 because I quote a, a pre-arranged medical appointment. Now, I have never heard of that as an excuse. And before I go on, I'd like to say that, hey, if this guy's got something serious going on or whatever, of course, I mean, you know, you take all the time you need. But arranging an appointment for the same day or night that you're meant to be captaining your country and it couldn't be rearranged, not prearranged, why couldn't it be rearranged? To me, the evidence is all pointing in one direction. We know where that direction is. It's called the T20 World Cup Circus and the multi-million dollar contracts and things. Is it real? I, that my feeling that this guy has checked out? He doesn't want to play for us anymore? Look, mate, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, he should have rebooked his appointment in the month of May and June. Oh, that's right, that's the IPL. Um, it's funny how in the month of June, too, his elbow just seems to come right, yet it's not good enough to play for New Zealand over the summer. Look, I'm hearing from some pretty close sources that there is a major divide between Gary Stead and Kane Williamson in terms of their philosophies. There is something fundamentally wrong with this cricket team at the moment. We're no longer winning. I'm sort of almost going back to my mantra when I look at the Black Caps and go, well, yeah, what's their mantra? Well, it's potential, potential, potential retirement. Um, And look, I think Kane Williamson, it's time for him just to step away from the white ball. I don't think he's playing well enough. What did he score? 50 the other day off 48 balls when we're chasing 180 odd runs to try and win. I mean it's ridiculous. There is nothing. He's so predictable in the way he captains. Maybe maybe it's a Gary Stead thing in the background. Something is not working but one of those two needs to step down. Uh, the other big news is clearly too and I'll just digress a little bit. Martin Guptill has now got out of his New Zealand contract and so he's going to become a gun for hire. Just want to acknowledge Martin Guptill. Yeah, um, yeah, great one day in the Nationals, yeah. averaging 42, averaging 30 in T20. Not such a great player away from New Zealand, but that quarterfinal of the World Cup um, against the West Indies back in, what was it, 2015? 15, was it the yeah, World 15, Cup? Yeah. 2015, you know, where he basically batted through the entire innings. First ball, last ball, he was there. Um, some great moments. And I think when you sit back and you look at, you look at our great one-day players... Um, and you're clearly going to include the McCullums and the Astles and the Crows, I think he's in the discussion, certainly at the top of the order. So well done to Martin Guptill. Um, and I hope and he goes on and gets some lucrative team. contracts to end his career because he absolutely deserves I think he's been poorly treated, I, you know, and... Um, but, you know, that seems to be the way... If, and, I, and I get the feeling that there is also a divide in that team. He was a great mate of Ross yeah. Taylor's. Uh, Ross and Kane, never really the greatest friends. And there, there is elements to that in this Black Cap selection. See, I'd dispute, I don't think Gary Stead's got a goddamn say in that side, mate. I think it's all about Kane Williamson. Whatever he wants, he goes. And New Zealand cricket pandered to him. As we have seen, he picks and chooses when he plays these days. You know, his, his post-match press conferences couldn't be more listless, tired, boring, mm. uninterested, disinterested if he tried. This guy is meant to be the public face of New Zealand cricket. If you can't, you know, if you, if you can't be bothered sitting there putting a smile on your face and going, through the motion, motion. Look, Mark, and this is you've got to acknowledge this. The way that the Black Ferns players have related to their fans, their public, has just been absolutely brilliant. It's been refreshing, hasn't it, as far as New Zealand sports goes? And then we play quotes from the All Blacks alongside that. And, you know, we spoke about this last week. You've got to wonder what has happened? Have we, is, is this New Zealand cricket, New Zealand rugby, have they drilled and drummed the personality out of their players? Are, are we so serious about the way we consider the All Blacks and the New Zealand men's cricket team that the fun aspect has actually gone? Because it needs a bloody injection, doesn't it? Well, you've got to start enjoying well, these look, sports again. They remind me of governments who now have become so paranoid that they just want to control the message. Uh, they have their spin companies in the background and they will put out there what they want to put out. But sport needs personality. It needs colour. Tennis was never more popular when you had Nastasi, when you had the likes of McEnroe, Jimmy Connors. Um, sport, you know, you go back, you look at the Mike Tysons, you just look at those colourful personalities, Dennis Rodman. Sport needs that. And for some reason, that's no longer acceptable anymore, and particularly here in New Zealand. And I'm 100% on board with this. We've got to bring that colour back. And I think the Black Ferns, like motorsport drivers, like a lot of smaller sports, the athletes within so-called smaller sports, 
sports here are so desperate for media coverage. They understand sponsorship. They understand their commercial arrangements. They just put themselves out there. How accessible is someone like a Shane Van Gisbergen? And you consider how big he is because he understands the business that he is in. You know, these media managers, they are media prevention officers, aren't they? It's almost just too much effort these days to put somebody forward for you, to get an honest and decent answer out of them. And then they wonder why crowds are diminishing. Then they wonder why people are no longer watching. I, I mean, I saw that game yesterday at the MCG between Australia the and England. The smallest crowd about, kind of about 3,000 people. You've got some of the greatest players that have ever played the game. And then you even go and have a look at the interest in this ODI series between India coming up and the T20 last night in Napier. And cricket is in serious trouble. In serious trouble. And I'm not sure what the answer is. I mean, I'll ask you this, Martin. How does cricket capture the buzz of the 1980s, the buzz of the 1990s? Where does that look? How does that look? Because I can't see it, because the IPLs come along, the players have made it all about themselves, they somehow think that the whole world's watching the IPL, no one is, it's just another way of the Indian laundering a whole lot of money, and a whole lot of cricketers getting rich, and then at the same time, they're too big to talk to the media, guys like me and you who might critique them or go after them, or we just get simply blacklisted, and we don't know what we're talking about, Martin, and that's what I love about the English Premier League, we've spoken about this before, pick up the English Premier, nine different narratives constantly going on, it's open, it's a free-for-all, you've got the Ronaldo story which is still driving interest, you've got the positive stories going on, but not us, no, no, we'll just reduce it to the first ball and the last ball, reduce rugby to the 80 minutes in the middle of the park, and it's not enough these days in, in our lives when we've got so many other options where we can spend our time, where we can spend our disposable income. Apologise to me! I'll leave you with Ronaldo then, and the rumour is that he's going to go to Liverpool. Uh, you're going to swap him straight for Salah, who will come to us. Wouldn't that be glorious, mate? God, you have been smoking it this morning, haven't you, Martin? Let me guess, Ronaldo's this season with Manchester United, what, an A-minus based on your scale of media? Oh. Did you give him an A-minus this year, an A-minus, mate? I mean, a B-minus for the All Blacks, Ronaldo probably an A-minus. Let me guess, the three Barrett brothers that grew up on a farm, what are we going to give them? What, what, what? Oh, that must be about an A-plus. Look, the Ronaldo situation's an interesting one. Ronaldo has to realise he's not the player that he once was. He's 38 years of age. He doesn't cover as much distance as much now. He's not as busy as he once was. He's lost just that ounce of speed. He still believes he's good as he once was, and therefore everybody should drop everything they're doing and build a team around him, and that's not the way. And so it'll be interesting to see what his next steps are. Manchester United, just get rid of Harry Maguire, and I think you guys will move in a new direction, and you might eventually, eventually get yourself off the History Channel and uh, into a more modern channel where things in today are actually relevant. Devlin. Words matter. I was going to put him in, uh, foot, foot, excuse me. The Platform.